Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Anthony and team. Good morning. Welcome, Cross Connection Church. You can be seated. So good to see all of you here this morning and to hear you praising the Lord with us. It's so good to hear everybody join together. Thankful that God has called us together to be his people and to gather in his presence. So good. Hey, one of the things I want to throw out to you before we get into the message this morning. One of the things that we did, obviously, it is the Christmas season and we're leading up to our Christmas celebration here at Cross Connection Church. One of the things that we did before COVID happened is the last Sunday before Christmas, we invited people to wear, well, one time we said ugly Christmas sweaters, but here's the problem with that. Somebody inevitably shows up with like their favorite Christmas sweater and you compliment their ugly Christmas sweater and then they get all offended. So, so we're just going to call it like loud Christmas clothing. So, so that happens to be December 24th, Christmas Eve day. We're going to gather here for our regular services on Sunday, Christmas Eve. And so if you come wearing your loud Christmas clothing, you can rest assured I will probably be wearing something as well. So I hope to see you all there. How many of you have a, fam a favorite Christmas song? Oh, good, good. Like Wham, Last Christmas. <laughs> Santa baby? <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> I don't know. If that is your Christmas song, God bless you. Your favorite. There's some great Christmas songs in this time of year. You know, you start to hear them coming on the radio or maybe they play them at home. Uh, you know, there's a lot of great ones. You know, there's the, there's the ones that are kind of like the popular ones that dominate our, our culture, our Western culture, White Christmas, Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas, Jingle Bell Rock, those sort of things. But then, then there, of course, are the more traditional Christian Christmas songs, things like Joy to the World, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Him, O Come All Ye Faithful. One of my favorites, maybe you like this one as well, is O Holy Night. Now, I'm not going to sing it. Yeah. yeah. I'm not going to sing it. The worship team has left the building, so I'm not going to sing it. But the lyrics are great. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees, O oh, hear the angel voices, O oh, night divine. O night when Christ was born, O night, O holy night, O night divine. I think that's like one of the perfect Christmas songs. And I love that lyric there in the middle that says, a thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. This Christmas season, as we do every year leading up to Christmas, we are talking about Advent. We're talking about the arrival of Jesus. That's what that word Advent means. The Latin Adventus means the arrival or the coming. And at this time, we remember Jesus is coming to this world and we celebrate his arrival to the world because as he comes, he not only arrives as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Emmanuel, God with us, but he also brings with him many wonderful things, which are things that Christians have been remembering and celebrating for many centuries. In many more traditional churches, as you lead up to Christmas, the four Sundays before Christmas, the themes of hope and joy and peace and love are remembered. And that's what we are remembering here at Cross Connection. Last week, if you were here, we talked about peace. The peace that Jesus brings when he comes is a peace that surpasses understanding. It is a peace that guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. It is a peace that is greater than the peace that the world is oftentimes looking for or thinks that they have found. It's more than just the cessation of violence but it speaks of total human thriving and well-being. And that is the peace that we rejoice in, that Jesus brings, the peace that gives us wonderful rest. Jesus' arrival into the world is the arrival of that kind of peace. But not only that, as we're going to consider this week, point number one, if you're taking notes this Sunday, the advent of Jesus is the advent of hope. And this is one of my favorite topics to talk about. And if you have attended Cross Connection Church for any length of time, you've heard me talk about hope and the arrival of Jesus signaling the advent of this hope many times before. It is one of my favorite things to talk about because I believe and 
Also, there have been studies, especially in the last you know, five decades or so, that have shown that this is the case. We cannot live without hope. One of the great books, and I, I recommend it to you, although it is a heavy read, it's a short read. It wouldn't take you very long, even for a dyslexic like me. I'm serious about that. But uh, it's a book called Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was a psychologist, but more than that, he lived through the death camps, the concentration camps of, of uh, Germany in the Second World War. And he discovered during that time there, living through it as a Jewish man, but also at a, as a man who is trained in psychological sciences, he understood the reality of what hope brings to a person and what happens to an individual or a group of people when they lose hope. And so we desperately need hope. And we live in a weary world. A weary world rejoices at the thrill of hope that Jesus brings into this world. You don't have to look very far around us in this culture to see that we are living in a burdensome and wearying world, a world that is burdened by the bondage of sin. It's so very clear. People are burdened by financial concerns. Maybe that would be you this morning. And this time of year, those things seem to amplify for a lot of people, especially if you own a business that's in the retail space. You're hoping that this time of year would be the time that would, for many retailers, bring them into the black and that's why they call it Black Friday or have called it Black Friday in the past because as they come to the end of the year and for many people coming to the end of the year is the end of their fiscal year and they're looking at that and thinking, hopefully we can clear and get into the black because we've been in the red. And maybe if you're not a, a retail person or a business owner, maybe you're experiencing that as well, that we, we all have seen the increase of costs. Inflation is high and you really feel it when you go and put gas in your car, don't you? I mean, my car just like slurps up gas like a little kid slurping up, you know, a Slurpee. It's just like you can hear the gasoline just like <laughs> in my Suburban. And then when you go and you put that thing in there, and it's like you just watch that thing like a slot machine just go by. It's just like, goodness gracious, you can kind of feel that pain in your wallet the entire time. So it's a burden, financial concerns. And when you come to this time of year, there's the expectation of also giving and receiving gifts. And so there's the added burden of that. And for, for many of you, there are increased costs at the end of the year or coming into the beginning of the year. So people are burdened by financial concerns. People are burdened, I know this, by scheduling pressures. I see this when I talk with people and our common greeting is to say to someone, how are you doing? And I would say probably eight out of 10 times when I ask someone, how are you doing? Their response is busy. I know I'm guilty of saying that. I just did right in between the services. Someone came and asked me, how are you doing? I said, I've been busy. And so we can find ourselves burdened by scheduling pressures. Certainly many people are burdened by the things that they see in the news, especially news of war over the last couple of years in Europe and over the last couple of months in the Middle East. And even if those things were cleared up, as I shared last week, there would be more news of war or embattled nations in other places. Wars and rumors of wars, the scriptures talk about the entire time of history from the time that Jesus ascended into heaven until the time that he will return will be dominated by nation rising against nation and kingdom against kingdom. That is what we see. And we feel the pressure of that, the burden of it. There's also the burden of political division. And let me tell you, 2024, it's going to be chaotic. We already know that. But it's a presidential election year, and you can already feel the cycle ramping up, and the political divisions are very, very strong. And it's hard because you get together with either coworkers at Christmas parties or family members and friends at Christmas parties, and inevitably there will be the conversations about politics that will come up. And it's such a tense, divided sort of thing that happens. So we can feel the burden of all of these things, and the weight of those burdens, they can weigh heavily upon us to the point that. Sometimes we lose sleep to the point that sometimes we feel the physiological effects of stress upon us. And all of that weight of the broken and sinful world that we live in, I don't think that we could bear it if it were not for hope. And Advent is a reminder to you and a reminder to me that Jesus in his coming is bringing hope. And it is a certain kind of hope. A hope that is greater than the hope that the world often offers to us. A weary and hopeless world is a hellish place without the kind of hope that Jesus gives. 
And the fact that he brings this kind of hope to us, that is what we would call good news, and good news is gospel. That's what you and I have to share with people. Hopefully you've already received that good news of the fullness of hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We're going to talk a little bit more about it this morning, but I hope that you have received that hope such that you're experiencing it and you have rest as a result of it and that you can share it with others. And I want to challenge you as I did the first service this morning. This season, if you know that hope and you have experienced that given to you by Christ through the gospel, would you accept the challenge to share that with at least one person? There are a lot of people who you and I know who are hopeless. They are despairing. They are desperate. They are maybe depressed because of all the crazy things that are happening in their life or in the world, whether it's financial pressures or political division or whatever it may be, it weighs upon them. And we all know hopeless people. And you and I have been given a certain hope in Jesus Christ. And it is a hope that surpasses this world's hope, the offerings of this world, because the hope that the scriptures speak of is a hope that does not disappoint. Paul says it like this in the book of Romans chapter 5. You can turn there if you'd like, but if not, I'm going to read it. So Romans chapter 5, it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, that is, by our trust in Jesus Christ, we are made right with God. That's what justified means, to be made right with God. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace, like we talked about last week, with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope and hopeful anticipation of the glory of God, the revelation of the glory of God. When you are justified by grace through faith, trusting in Jesus Christ, you now have peace with God, peace from God, the peace of God in your life. I talked about this last week. If you weren't here, you can find it on YouTube. But now we stand in that peace, in that grace, and we rejoice in joy-filled anticipation, hope, of the coming glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. Who on earth rejoices or glories in the midst of troubling circumstances and difficulties? Only the kind of person that experiences this hope. We glory in tribulations knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character increases hope or builds hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. Hope does not disappoint. Point number two, if you're taking notes. Jesus brings a sure and steadfast hope that does not disappoint. And this is gospel. This is good news because the hope that is on offer here in our culture and in our broken world is a hope that routinely disappoints. If your hope is in your baseball team, your hope is going to be disappointed. If your hope is in your investments, your hope is going to be disappointed. If your hope is in your good looks, or your health, or your intelligence, or even maybe people in your family, if your hope is found in those things, your hope is going to be disappointed because your intelligence will fail. People in your life will fail you. Your investments will go up and then they will come down. Politicians will falter, medicine, science, technology, all of these things will falter, but Jesus brings a sure and steadfast hope that does not disappoint. You see, when you get into the scriptures and you start to do a study on this concept, this idea of hope that Jesus brings to us, you discover that it is an absolute and certain confidence in future good, an absolute certainty in coming good. It is not the hope that we think of in this world. The hope of this world is typically an optimistic feeling kind of hope or a wishful thinking kind of hope. Biblical hope is absolute certainty. Worldly hope is an optimistic feeling. I I feel good about this. Have you ever felt good about something that you were hoping in only to find that you didn't feel so good about it a week or two later? (laughs) Or it's the wishful thinking kind of hope. The kind of hope that says, I wish or I hope that I win the lottery. And again, if you are investing in that, that's the bad investment. (laughs) But even still, if that's your hope, that's a wishful thinking kind of hope. And that's the hope that we often encounter in this world. Blind, optimistic hope, 
wishful thinking kind of hope, but biblical hope is an absolute certainty of coming good. And because of this kind of hope that we are given in Christ Jesus, we have a sure and steadfast foundation even in tribulations, even in difficult times. And that surety, that assurance that we have from the hope that Jesus gives to us the author of the New Testament book of Hebrews tells us that that becomes like an anchor for our soul. The soul is the part of you that gets troubled by all the burdensome things of this world. The soul is the part of you that experiences anxiety and fear and worry and concern. And this kind of hope that's given to us in Jesus that is not blind optimistic hope or wishful thinking hope, but is sure and steadfast hope, it anchors us through difficult circumstances. Let me read from Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 18 says, So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things, these two things, his promise and his oath, are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, because it is impossible for God to lie and he has given us his oath and his promise, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. That's the kind of hope that I need. And that's the kind of hope that Jesus gives to us in the gospel. A hope that is strong and trustworthy and anchor for our soul. And it's this sure and steadfast, trustworthy anchor that holds us in the midst of storms, it is this kind of hope that gives us what we talked about last week, peace. A peace that surpasses understanding. A peace that is unexplainable to the person in our lives who is watching us go through trials and tribulations and difficulties with this kind of hope. They stand there in awe and say, how are you not troubled by this? And you have no explanation. Because it defies logic. It surpasses understanding. It guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. It helps us to have rest in the midst of the storm. Practical, beautiful illustration of this is found in the Gospels when Jesus is there in a boat, asleep, in a storm on the Sea of Galilee, and his disciples are fearful and fretting and thinking they're going to die, and he's asleep. And they come and they wake him up and they say, don't you even care that we're dying? Have you ever felt like that with Jesus? Like, like routinely? And, and he stands up and he commands the wind and the waves to be still. And he says, why were you afraid? Well, you know, it was a, there was a storm. There was a storm. Hanging out with Jesus can be interesting. Beautiful illustration of it. Peace in the midst of the storm. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our soul. So because of this kind of absolute certainty of future good in Christ Jesus, this kind of hope, we can have peace and rest in the midst of the storm. And as we'll talk about next week, we can have a joy that is increasing unto abundance for eternity. You see, the joys and the happiness, and I'm getting ahead of myself because this is next week's message, the joys and the happiness of this world is all fleeting. It's here one moment and gone the next. We all have experienced that. But the joy that we can have in Christ because of his coming, his advent, that gives us hope and gives us peace, this joy is increasing unto abundance for eternity. It will never end. In his presence is fullness of joy. That's next week's message. You have to come back. <laughs> All of this is found in and by Jesus Christ. This is good news. This is gospel. This is what we receive in Christ because of his coming, his advent, because of what we'll rejoice in later on at the end of March in his death, burial, and resurrection, this is what we receive through the gospel. This is what we have on offer to the world. And this is what people desperately want and need. People are seeking for peace and hope and joy and love. That's what they're desperately looking for. We see the manifestations of this, this search in our culture that people are desperately looking for something to satisfy these deep needs, and they think they've found it in all kinds of different things. You thought you found it in times past as well. Maybe it was in some substance that you took or you injected, or maybe it was in some uh, activity that you engaged in that you didn't want other people to know about. Whatever it was, you thought this would fill the void, and it never does. But we see it in our culture, 
And people are being lied to and told that if you just do this thing to your body, if you just put this into you, that this will make you feel better as you have this deep longing for something. You can't articulate what it is and you can't find it. And they never find rest and peace and hope in these things. And this is why there is an increase of suicide for many of the people who go down that path. This is what Solomon speaks about in the book of Ecclesiastes. And he ultimately says, none of these things brought what I was looking for. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. That's like saying emptiness, emptiness, all is emptiness. That's 3,000 years old. I thought it was interesting. And I even sent it to the guys on our our pastoral uh, text message yesterday. Elon Musk, the richest man in the world. He posted something on X yesterday. And it just simply said, wisdom, greater sign, greater sign, wealth. Wisdom is greater than wealth. The richest man in the world is telling you something that Solomon learned 3,000 years ago. It's fascinating. But our culture keeps saying, no, it's going to be found in this thing, hope and rest and peace and joy, and none of those things will satisfy. So the great philosophers of our time sing songs. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I can't get no satisfaction. (laughs) What are they saying? The same thing that Solomon said thousands of years ago. But the true thing that we're desiring, peace, hope, joy, love, it's found in that little baby of Bethlehem, the advent of Jesus. These things are found in him. And this idea, this thread of hope is seen from Eden to eternity. Genesis chapter 3, the Garden of Eden, all the way through the rest of the Bible to Revelation 22, the last chapter of the Bible, and beyond. When God made all things, back in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, he looked at what he had created and said, it is good. Seven times in the opening chapter of the Bible, God said, it is good, it is good, it is good. At the end of it, he says, it is very good, and then it is destroyed. The goodness of God's perfect creation is devastated by sin. In Genesis chapter 3, Paul says it like this in Romans 5. Through one man sin into the world and death through sin and death spread to all humanity. And we all now, thousands of years after, still feel the weight of sin and death in this broken world. And all of creation, Romans 8 says, groans for the day when things will be restored. There is this deep desire for redemption and renewal and restoration in the heart of every single living being throughout all of creation and humans feel it acutely, deeply within us. We're longing for it. And there in Genesis chapter three, when sin entered in and brokenness and death by sin, at the very moment that that comes in, there is this promise. Remember Hebrews 6 says that we have this hope that comes to us by God's sure promise and oath that began at the very instant that sin came in in Genesis chapter 3. Verse 15 gives us the first wink, if you will, into God's redemptive plan where we read this. Genesis 3 verse 15. God is speaking to Adam and Eve and to the serpent that had deceived them and led them into sin and says, I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman and between your seed and her seed and he, the one that's going to come from the woman, shall bruise or crush your head, serpent, and you will bruise or crush his heel. So he says, God does there in that instant when sin came in, there is going to come one, a man from the seed of a woman who's going to destroy the work of the serpent that has brought sin and death to the entire world. He's going to crush, deliver a death blow, crush his head. Yes, he will be wounded in the process. You shall crush his heel, but he will bring a death blow. Theologians call this passage of scripture in Genesis 3 verse 15, the proto-euangelion. It's just a big theological term that means the first gospel. This is the first allusion for a lot of Bible students and theologians to the coming redemptive work that God is going to give right here in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. The original promise of his coming right there at the very moment that sin came in. This promise of redemption that gives us hope. And so this thread of hope continues from Eden all the way through to Revelation. And we see the theme and the concept of hope come up constantly in the Old Testament. Whether it's there in Genesis chapter 3 at the fall, or you fast forward a little bit and you get to the book of Exodus, when the children of Israel are in Egypt under oppression and bondage as slaves being severely oppressed by harsh taskmasters, and they call out to God for deliverance. 
and he raises up a redeemer, a deliverer, and Moses. And so there is this desire for deliverance and renewal, and, and God answers it in a small part through Moses, and all of this is typology and picture of the coming future king who's going to bring about redemption, but it all is pointing in that direction. And so you have Genesis 3 at the fall. You have Exodus there when they're in Egypt. You fast forward. We're going to see this in the new year when we get into the stories of the book of Judges and beyond, and we get into the history of Israel. And constantly, this idea and this concept of hope comes to the surface. And where does it come? When people are trapped in a storm, when they are under oppression and bondage, whether it is under the oppression and bondage of Egypt or the oppression and bondage of the Canaanites or the Philistines, or you continue on to the time of the prophets like the prophet Isaiah and Jeremiah, where the children of Israel were under the oppressive, oppressive bondage of the Assyrians in the 8th century BC or the Babylonians in the 5th and 6th century BC. And at each time, the children of Israel under this bondage have this hope, this glimmer of hope for one who would come to deliver. They're looking forward to one they call the Messiah, the anointed one. And in the midst of all of this, God, through his prophets, would encourage them with words of comfort about this coming redemption that was promised by God's oath all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. God's promised deliverance and deliverer. You see it a lot in books like Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40 is a beautiful passage where the children of Israel, they have just come out of a time of bondage under the Assyrians. This is about 2,800 years ago. The Assyrians led by King Sennacherib have just utterly obliterated the nation of Judah, the southern tribe of Israel, and only one city is left. All the other cities have been totally destroyed by Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and the children of Israel, they've just been rescued and redeemed by God's miraculous work, but they are also told in the midst of it, there's going to come a coming future oppression by the Babylonians. And in the midst of that, think about that, the darkness of that despair, in the midst of it, God says these words through the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 40 verse one, comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. How can you have comfort in the midst of such a severe and dark storm? The Assyrians have just destroyed your nation. All you have to look forward to is the coming of the Babylonians. Comforts. Comfort, my people, says God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. They've just been told that more warfare is coming. And yet God, through the prophet, says your warfare is ended. He looks forward to a future day when all warfare is done. Their warfare is ended. Their iniquity is pardoned. Sin is dealt with, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. The mouth of the Lord has spoken it. In the midst of deep bondage and darkness and oppression, in the valley between two peaks of great oppression from the Assyrians and the Babylonians, God says, there's coming a day when all of this will be done. And your sin will be pardoned and the glory of the Lord will be revealed. They're looking forward to a future kingdom. At least that's what God is seeking to encourage them with. And that's where this comfort come from, comes from. Where does the comfort come from? The hope that is given through God's sure word and promise. In the New Testament, the Apostle Peter, he says, we have the more sure word of prophecy. God has prophetically told us what is ultimately coming in the future by his Messiah, by his anointed one, Jesus, Emmanuel. And this gives us hope, and that hope is a comfort to us. It's an anchor for our soul. A thrill of hope. A weary world rejoices looking forward to the dawning of that new and glorious morn. During these deep times of dark bondage for the children of Israel, when they would feel like all hope was gone, their blind optimistic hope was gone, their wishful thinking hope was devastated, in the midst of that, God would come by the prophets and say, I am going to bring about my deliverer. And God would hint at who this deliverer was going to be. We know from Genesis 3.15, it was going to be a man born of a woman. You fast forward a little bit to Genesis chapter 12, and we learn that it's going to come through the family of a man named Abram or Abraham. 
You fast forward a little bit further in Genesis and you find out that it's going to come through Abraham's son, Isaac. You continue on the story and you find it's going to come through Isaac's son, Jacob. You follow the story a little bit further and the prophets foretell it's going to come through Jacob's son, Judah. You keep following and you find it's going to come through Judah's line through a man named Jesse and through Jesse's son, David. And you go down on through the ages and we're told that he's going to be born of a virgin in Isaiah 7. We're told in Micah 5 that he's going to be born in Bethlehem. All of these times in the midst of great darkness, you have this thread of hope from Eden to eternity where God is saying, I am bringing my Redeemer. And what is it that we celebrate every year, which we order our entire calendar by, but the coming of this one who fulfills that hopeful promise? Who gives us not a blind, optimistic hope or a wishful thinking hope, but who gives us a sure and steadfast hope that is like an anchor for our soul. Point number three, if you're taking notes, the hope that the prophets predicted is the hope that gives us ultimate comfort. I think you already know this, but I think it's worth reminding you. Our hope is not found in our investments. It's not found in our intelligence or ingenuity. It's not found in our job or our health or our family or our nation and its leaders. If all of those things are ripped from us, we can still have a hope that gives a sure and steadfast anchor for our soul. Why? Because it is an ultimate hope in Christ Jesus and by Christ Jesus that is not seated in this world. It is an otherworldly hope that redirects our attention and focus into another world. Though all these things that people hope in be devastated, we can still have a sure and steadfast hope in Christ. And it is this hope that the psalmist says in Psalm 16, verse 9, gives us rest. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh will rest in hope. It is this kind of hope which is found in Christ Jesus that gives us courage and strength of heart. Psalm 31, verse 24. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart, all you who hope in the Lord. It is this kind of hope that is a comfort for our souls, a sure and steadfast anchor, as Hebrews chapter 6 says. It is this kind of hope that comes in Jesus Christ that gives us joy and peace in believing. Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of all hope fill you with joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I love to talk about this because I think it's such an important thing. We cannot live without hope. Life in a broken world would be hellish without hope. It's only found in Christ. And for those of you this morning that have put your trust in Jesus Christ and have this hope accessible to you in Christ Jesus, you may remember there was a time where you were without hope in this world. Paul talks about it in Ephesians chapter 2. There, I'll read it real quick. Therefore, remember that you were once Gentiles in the flesh who were called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision. You were not a part of the family of faith, the Jewish people. At that time, you were without Christ. You were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers of the covenants and promises. You were not given the promises and covenants that they had. You had no hope and were without God in this world. Some of you remember very well when you were without hope, without Christ. And some of you this morning, you don't yet have that hope. So, How, where do you get it? How do you find it? Well, a lot of the answers seem to be found in the book of Romans as it relates to these questions. Romans chapter five, I looked at it last week and again, very important. Therefore, having been justified by faith, that is, you are made right with God by your trust in Jesus Christ. Having been justified by faith, because of that, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus, through whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. It can all be boiled down to this. Point number four, grace from God brings peace with God, giving us hope in God. Jesus is God's gracious gift. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes and trusts in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That is God's grace to us in Jesus Christ. It gives us peace with God, peace from God, so that we have the peace of God, and there we have hope in God for eternity. 
He came to give his life a ransom for many, to seek and to save that which is lost, to give life and that more abundantly. Those are like the purpose statements of Jesus. Some of you are in business management. You know that a lot of time and money is spent in business management on articulating the purpose and the mission of an organization. Jesus gives in the gospels his clearly stated purpose statements. John 10, verse 10, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. The gospel of Mark, the gospel of Luke, he says, I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. Luke chapter 19, I've come to give my life a ransom for many. Mark chapter 16, there in these passages, he says, this is my purpose. That's why he came 2,000 years ago at Christmas, to seek and to save that which is lost. And how do we receive this gift of his grace and the peace and the hope that comes with it? Well, we've talked about it many times before. Again, the answer seems to be found in Romans so much here in this passage. Romans chapter 10, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be redeemed, saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, they're made right with God, justified. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. They will not have disappointed hope. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I believe it was in one of Paul's letters to Timothy. He said, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. In that passage, he says, of whom I am chief. And some of you might argue with Paul there in that passage. But Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And when you receive his saving grace, by trusting in his finished work on the cross, which he came 2,000 years ago at Advent to do, to accomplish, when you trust in him, you are given a sure and steadfast hope. Your wishful thinking, blind, optimistic hope is done away with. Many times I've had the conversation with people who are not yet Christians, and I ask them a simple question. If you died tonight, do you think you'd go to heaven? And they say, well, I hope so. And you ask them, well, what's the basis of that hope? Well, I'm a pretty good person. That doesn't sound like sure and steadfast hope. And it's not very hard to realize you're not a very perfect person. And if your hope is built on that wishful thinking, blind optimistic hope, well, I hope, you know, God, he's very loving and I hope he's going to overlook all my sins. That blind optimism. And I hope that my good works are going to outweigh my bad works. That's wishful thinking. Because Isaiah 64 verse 6 says all of our righteousness is as filthy rags before him. He is perfect and we are so far from that. There's no hope in that. But there's hope in Christ that brings peace and rest and joy. A joyful and peaceful rest in hope is the ultimate end or purpose, tell us, of our faith. Point number five, and I'll wrap it up. Our ultimate expectation and hope culminate in Christ and his kingdom. Listen, I think you know this, but I think it's worth reminding you. Your hope is not in this world. My hope is not in the state of California. That keeps being driven home quite frequently. (laughs) My hope is not in the United States of America. My hope is not in the military might or the financial strength of this country or our credit rating as a people or my credit score as an individual. My hope is not in those things. And if my hope is in those things, God will allow that hope to be totally shaken to the point where you find yourself in total despair. And I can guarantee this, everybody in this room, because we have seen the decline in mental health in our culture, everybody here knows somebody who is struggling with anxiety and depression. And and pretty much I've had many conversations with people who are anxious and depressed and always at at the base of it, what triggered it was something that they hoped in got disappointed. They hoped that that marriage would work out and satisfy and it didn't. They hoped that that business that they set out to build and invested all of their energy, time, and assets into. They hoped that it would make good, and it fell apart. They hoped that that relationship, they hoped that whatever it was, that thing would fix it and make it right, and they gave all of their energy and all of their time and all of their prayers and devotion to that thing, and then one day, in like a moment, it all just flashed in the pan and was gone. And they find themselves down on the ground broken. As horrible as that place is, there's only one place you can go from there. 
to look to Christ. He is our hope. And ultimately, our hope in him is his kingdom, where he comes and brings the fullness of his kingdom and restores all things that are broken and wipes away every tear, as Revelation says. From Eden to eternity, from Genesis to Revelation, the thread of hope all points to him and his kingdom. That's what this whole Christmas thing is all about. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer? Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the comfort that we can find in the scriptures. And I pray, God, that we would turn, first and foremost, primarily to the comfort of the scriptures. When we see all the things in this world that ultimately are not strong enough for us to hope in. God, would you help us to set our minds on things above, to fix our focus on you, to seek those things which are with you in your kingdom, to realize that our life is hidden with you and that when you, our life, when you appear, we will be with you in glory. And Lord, I pray that that hope would dominate our hearts and our minds. And Lord, I pray that you would help each and every person here to not only know and experience that hope, but Lord, help us this season to share it with somebody else because there are a lot of hopeless people in our culture in such desperate need of something strong and steadfast, enduring to find refuge in and ultimately, that's only found in you. God, help us to remember that this Christmas. Help us to share it with others. For we ask this in Jesus' name, and all those that agreed said, Amen. Amen. Let's sing to the Lord.